Okay, take two. I, I, I was told I had a slow internet connection, as I usually do, and now I don't, so let's see what happens. Anyhow, morning, evening, wherever you are, uh, talking about two uh, highly anticipated films that have opened yesterday, that opened yesterday in Hong Kong, and uh, one of them is, um, it's opened, uh, it's rolling out around the world, and I think the other one also uh, opened yesterday in many places around the world and rolling out. First one is The Lion King, the 2019 um, live action, and I'm saying live action because I don't think it is should be called live action, but that's what Disney is calling it, live action remake of the 1994 old school animated film. Highly, highly, I think it's Disney, I think the original Lion King is Disney's most uh, successful film, financially successful film. Well, this one probably will be the next, you know, the next uh, number one. Um, in case you haven't seen, well, let me, let me just say first, before I talk about that, you know, there's been, you know, some of the reviews have come out, there have been quite a few reviews come out the past week, and pretty much everybody is saying the film looks absolutely amazing, but completely pointless, like what was, you know, it doesn't really add anything to the original. Um, yeah, that's, um, that's what I'm going to talk about. So in case you haven't seen the original film from 1994, it tells the uh, Shakespearean story, the debatably Shakespearean story, because I don't buy that line either, the Shakespearean story of Simba, the lion cub who was born to Mufasa, the king of the Pride Lands in the Serengeti. And Simba has a knack of getting himself and others into uh, jams, into spots, and one of, of those jams results in the death of his father. So he's heartbroken and he's feeling guilty. This isn't spoilers. Everybody's seen the film. He's heartbroken, he's feeling guilty, and thanks to his uncle, evil, his evil uncle Scar's um, uh, machinations, he goes into self-imposed exile, and he, um, and he you know, he... he uh, Scar takes over the pride. And Simba eventually meets up with Pumba, a flatulent warthog, and Timon, a chatty meerkat, and the three of them live a Hakuna Matata existence far from the pride lands. Now, if you don't know what Hakuna Matata means, I guess you haven't seen the original, so you'll find out. And Scar, in the meantime, back, back home in the pride lands, Scar and his hyena friends have uh, turned what was once a beautiful uh, part of Africa, into an ecological wasteland. And when his childhood friend Nala shows up one day hunting for prey, she convinces Simba that he must go home and fight Scar to take up his rightful place as king. So that's the story. Now, of course, yeah, I mean, you can sort of see the similarities between this film and, uh, and uh, Hamlet. Um, you know, there's some similarity, but I'm not buying it. Now, with this film, there, there, there have been some very minor tweaks to the original story. For example, the female lions, the lionesses in the pride, now do the hunting, and that's what lionesses do. So, uh, you know, they're, they're, in terms of female empowerment, this is it. Um, but essentially, this story is the old story. There's very, very little that's different. In fact... For most of the film, you would be forgiven if you were if you were experiencing if you thought you were experiencing deja vu. It's shot for shot, note for note, word for word, identical to the original. Now, director John John Favreau says, "Hey, it's a half hour longer." Yeah, okay. So there's a few other things that have been thrown in. There's an extra song or two, um, but you know. No, 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 no. This is the same story. The big difference is the animation. Now, it is, now, as I said, Disney is telling everybody it's live action. There is nothing live about it. There, this is all animation. The only difference is, I would say, this animation has taken it to a whole new level. It's photorealistic. You, are, you, are think, you will think you're watching a documentary on, or a show on Animal Planet because it is so... The documentary, the uh, animation is so lifelike, it's, it's amazing. I mean, many critics have said, yeah, but the mouths don't quite sync up to the movement of the, 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 what's coming out of their mouths, you know, the voices and their songs. I didn't notice that at all. Um, okay, I, I'm not, I'm not going to say it's nitpicking or whatever. I didn't notice it.
Actually, I did notice it once. Now that I think back, I did notice it once. But, yeah, okay, fine, you know. But, you know, so I give him 10 out of 10 for the animation, 0 out of 10 for bringing anything new to the story. There's nothing new. There's absolutely nothing new. Now, in a... Di okay, well, okay, here's something that's new. In a, in a nod to diversity, the voice cast is mostly black, African-American, and uh, British. Um, black. So we have James Earl Jones. He's the only one who's reprised his, his uh, voice role from the original. He's back at, as Mufasa. I don't know anybody else who could have been Mufasa. Well, yeah, maybe, you know, maybe Morgan Freeman. But James Earl Jones is Mufasa. He's got the voice. Donald Glover has taken over from the very lily white uh, Matthew, Br Matthew Roderick as Br Broderick, Broderick as uh, as uh, Simba as the adult Simba, Beyonce has uh, taken over from Moira Kelly as the adult Nala, Chiwetel uh, Ejiofor has taken over from Jeremy Irons as Scar, and a young fellow by the name of J.D. McCrary he's taken over from Jonathan Taylor Thomas as the young Simba, just to name a few of the uh, the the black and the Afri African American. Uh, actors who've lent their voices. Now, of the whole group, I'd say Ejiofor is perhaps the weakest of them all um, because he doesn't have Irons' sonorous voice. He doesn't have the intonation. Look, he was okay, but but Jeremy Irons really embodied Scar. His voice was Scar. And and, uh, and so, you know, I think that was, that was, a, that was a letdown. So, um, you know, in terms of the voice cast, I say, okay, great. You know, it's being more diverse. It's more represent representational, representative of Africa. Now, the biggest improvements to the voice cast, the original voice cast, though, are the inclusion of Seth Rogen as Pumba, the uh, warthog, and Billy Eichner as, as Timon, the meerkat. And their banter back and forth is wonderful. You'll be roaring. Okay, that's a pun. I couldn't resist. You'll be roaring at their banter. And Eichner, by far, is the best thing about this film. Why is somebody sending me something right now? It's 8.30 in the morning. Um, so I, Eichner is the best thing about this film. And many people have said it, and I agree. He is the best thing about this film. Now, about that story... And whether it's Shakespeare, and I, I have to, I have to say, I was never a big fan of the original story. I found, um, as I said, it okay. You can sort of see the Hamlet connections, but what I saw when I saw the original story was not Hamlet. I saw the Bible. I saw Mufasa was God. I saw Simba was Jesus, and Scar was Satan. You know, as I was watching them, I was thinking, okay, is Simba Jesus or is Simba Adam? And no, Simba is Jesus, and Scar is Satan. And that, that didn't sit well with me. And look, I'm a religious person, but I don't like seeing that, you know, those, that sort of a subliminal message in, in, a, in a kid's movie, family movie. Um, but that didn't bother me as much as something else. In the original film, there are two scenes where you see the crescent moon, and Scar uh, is, is framed by this crescent moon. Scar, in the original film, Scar is dark furred, has a black mane, whereas Mufasa and um, Simba have tawny fur and manes. So in my mind, what the Lion King was, was this epic battle between Christianity and Islam, where Christianity are the good, good Christians are the good guys, and Muslims are the bad. Now look, I, I don't know that the people who, who, who did this originally, who wrote, who did the animation originally, or the people behind the original anime, uh, Lion King were, were anti-Islam. I don't know, but I think somewhere in their psyche, that was in there. This is what I believe. And I'm amazed, like, uh, when I thought about this, you know, when, when I sort of this is what I took from the, the original film. And as when I was working on my review, I, I decided I was going to go online and see, has anybody else noticed this? And I only found one other uh, person online. I put, published something online about this potential anti-Islam message that the Lion King has. So I'm amazed that, no, well, maybe I'm crazy, but I'm amazed that Muslims, by and large, haven't picked up on this, at least not in the... English language world, they haven't picked up on it. So, I don't know. Okay, and call me crazy. 
Now, but in this film, there is only one scene where Scar is framed against the crescent moon, and he's not as dark furred as his earlier incantation. Uh, inca incarnation. So, you know, again, I don't, you know, I'm not saying John Favreau is racist, I'm not saying he's anti-Muslim, but I think he could have been more sensitive to how the film uh, could have been perceived. And look, maybe he did notice this, is that what I'm saying? Because look, there was only one time of the Crescent Moon, and, and that sort of like, that dark, that dark image of Scar was, was scaled back. So maybe he did notice it, but didn't want to take it too far away from the original film. So I don't know, maybe I'm crazy, maybe I'm not, but this is how I feel. Now, story and, you know, subtleties aside, the songs never really did it for me either. You have, okay, I liked Hakuna Matata. I like Can You Feel the Love Tonight. They're still, they're still there. But you know what? They're pretty bland songs. They're, you know, they're not like, you know, they're not like supercalifragilisticexpialidocious, that type of music. I think these are rather bland. And even the circle of life, it's, to me, it's overstuffed. You know, it's, it's like, oh, you know, I, I didn't like it at all. And, it, and in this film, I don't like it either. Now, there's also in this film, there's two new songs. One is called Spirit, which is a soaring number, co-written and sung by Beyonce. And there's a song called Never Too Late, which is a bouncy tune that reeks of Oscar bait that's written by Elton John and Tim Rice, and it's performed by Elton John over this film's credits. Neither song is particularly memorable. And I checked the Billboard charts the other day uh, for Spirit, it's only number, like, okay, granted, it's very early, but it's only number 80 in the UK, top 100 single starts. Maybe now that the film is rolling out, maybe it'll go up. Well, I'm sure it'll go up, but I don't see it as being this, you know, huge song for the summer. So music really didn't, for, didn't do it for me either. So bottom line is, as I said, we have many, many, uh, of my colleagues, the majority of my colleagues, have said that this is a visual spectacle, but completely pointless. And you know what? When I disagree with them, I will tell you. But I don't disagree with them this time. I completely agree with them. This really, it's absolutely beautiful to watch, but completely useless. Um, the, the original film is better. This is beautiful, but the original film is better. Except for Billy Eichner. I gotta say. Now, but it doesn't really matter what I think, what they think, it doesn't really matter because the film opened last week or a week and a half ago in China, opened in China on the 19th, so what's about uh, a week ago. And, um, and last Friday, it opened last Friday in the US and elsewhere, and the film has already taken in more than a half a billion dollars. It'll most certainly break through the billion dollar mark before the film, before the summer's over. So who cares what I think? Who cares what anybody else thinks? This film, is bulletproof, it'll be very, very successful, Disney will be very happy, and John Favreau will go on and make more movies for Disney. So, what's up next? Milan, no, I guess there's Maleficent, but Milan is coming, there's uh, The Little Mermaid is coming, The Black Little Mermaid is coming, so um, there's going to be more of these, you know, Disney's just milking that cash cow as much as they can. So, that's my take on The Lion King. I wasn't impressed. In fact, I really would call it meh. Yeah. All right. The next big, highly anticipated film that opened yesterday in Hong Kong. I think it's op well, it's opening most you know uh, big markets around the world starting today and and over the next few weeks. It's called Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. It's the latest film by Quentin Tarantino. Now he's been in the news lately because he's been saying that his next film might just be his last film. Now he's working on, apparently he's written a screenplay for Star Trek and, and it hasn't been, it's not official yet that he is going to be directing the next Star Trek film. I think that would be amazing if he did because it'll be like any other Star Trek we've ever seen. But um, uh, it hasn't been, it hasn't been made official. Some people, some people are saying maybe Star Trek will be his last film. But other people, I think he's even one of them. I got to drink something because my voice is a raspy, <clears throat> but, he, but even he's saying, look, Star Trek isn't an original film, it's going to be a remake, so that won't count in this, you know, in his 10 films that he wants to do. So whether, <clears throat> whether the next film is, will be his last film, his second last film, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, opened 
yesterday here in Hong Kong. And I have to say, it's his most mature work, and it's also his least Tarantino-esque work. Now, the story, Once Upon a Time, it's been, gotten a lot of press. You've probably heard something about it. It takes audiences back to 1969 Los Angeles, which was a time of change, not just for the movie industry, but for America as a whole. You had Richard Nixon had just come to come into office. The Vietnam War was in full swing. Sirhan Sirhan admitted in court that he had killed Bobby Kennedy. NASA was gearing up to put a man on the moon. You know, the 50th anniversary was just the other day. I remember. And, and with all these events, and hippies are everywhere, and with all these events swirling around them, TV star Rick Dalton, played by Leonardo DiCaprio, and his longtime stunt double Cliff Booth, played by Brad Pitt, they're trying to come to terms with the reality that their careers in Hollywood are pretty much over as they reach middle age. I just want to stop here for a second because um, it's very interesting that... You know, both these actors, you know, in, 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 they were like teen idol. No, well, you know, yeah, I guess they were teen idols. Although, you know, Brad Pitt really, you know, he was, he was young when he, when he, you know, broke through with Thelma and Louise. But, you know, so many young girls, probably young boys too, had posters up of him up on the wall. And, of course, Leonardo DiCaprio um, especially. And now they're at that age. I think, I think Brad Pitt's about 55, Leonardo DiCaprio's, I think he's in his early 40s. Um, you know, they're at that age, they're, they're not young anymore. And, and, you know, very wisely and very, you know, and, and bravely for these actors, you see every wrinkle on their face, you know, on their faces. And I think, first of all, good for them for not using uh, Botox. But second of all, good for them for being brave enough to, to really show their faces and and in you know and like Quentin Tarantino you know he goes right in and you see all those wrinkles so I think that was that was you know of course it 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 really plays to the story about how they've cut you know they're reaching middle age and they're you know being turfed out of Hollywood because of you know Hollywood wants youth Hollywood wants glamour um, so I thought that was very very well done anyhow back to the story so Dalton was one a one time leading man. Um, but he's seen his body of work these days boil down to a series of guest TV spots where he's basically the bad guy of the week. And his new agent, Marvin Schwartz, not Schwartz, as he tells somebody, it's very funny, Marvin Schwartz, who's played by Al Pacino, he says, he tells uh, Dalton to consider going to Italy to do some spaghetti westerns. Dalton's not really, you know, he really doesn't want to do that. He wants to keep staying. He wants to stay in Hollywood and keep uh, trying to get, uh, you know, get back on top again. Um, Booth, Cliff, is Brad Pitt's character, he, he seems less concerned about his fate um, for now. Um, you know, he's settled into a routine. He's Dalton's chauffeur. He's his personal assistant. He's his confidant. He's his buddy. He's quite happy, you know. Um, he's a World War II veteran, and he's a very affable guy on the surface. Why are people sending me stuff so early in the morning? Crazy. Um, and, and um, you know, he's a very affable guy on the surface, but he's somebody you don't want to piss off. And as martial arts legend Bruce Lee, played by Mike Moe, from TV's Empire learns in a Hollywood backlot uh, while taking a break from shooting TV's Green Hornet. They can they get into a fight, and it's very very funny. Um, now, as the film opens, both Dalton and the audience learn that Dalton's new next door neighbors on Cielo Drive are director Roman Polanski, played by Polish actor Rafał Zawieruszka, Zawieruszka. And his wife, Sharon Tate, played by Margot Robbie, who is in everything these days. And unlike Dalton and Booth, who are fading, fading stars, Polanski and, Sta and Tate are fast-rising stars in Hollywood. They represent the new Hollywood. So that's, that's the story. Now, Tarantino's never made it a secret that he's a movie geek. And certainly, this film proves it once again. The attention to detail... To recreate this area is absolutely astounding from the cars, the clothing, the hairstyle, the furnitures, the, to the multiple movie marquees that you see, the billboard ads, the food packaging, uh, even the way the actors act and the, 
and the directors direct in the mo the TV movies and the and the the TV shows and the and the movies that are set within this movie. You know, you because it's Hollywood, you get to see you see how some films how some shows are made or were made back then and and how directors directed, how actors acted, how they spoke. You know, this is this is so the the sense of time is incredibly strong here. Absolutely incredible. And there's so much that you can that you'll want to take in that you're going to find yourself struggling to to keep up with the story. If you spend too much time dwelling on the set design, you're going to miss the story. And I found that happened to me the first couple of times. I'm like, I'm like, oh my God, look at this. And I'm trying, I'm focusing on that. In the meantime, the story is moving forward. And I go, oh, got to go back to the story. Got to pay attention to the story. And now as for that story, it is lumbering and borderline obsessive, I would say. <laughs> you know, not quite obsessive, but pretty, pretty darn close. But Tarantino manages to keep it uh, moving forward with ever, without ever making it boring. This is a long film. This is two hours and 40 minutes. I never once looked at my watch. My bum hurt by the end, but I never once hurt, looked at my watch. Now, the film features a huge ensemble cast. It includes a few old-time TV stars like 90-year-old Clue Gulliger. He was in the film a couple years ago called Blue Jay. I reviewed that on my website, howardforfilm.com, howardforfilm.com. He was also, he was, I, I suppose he's most famous for a TV show in the 60s called The Virginian. It also has a 79-year-old Brenda Vaccaro. I looked her, look, I knew who she was. I know who she is. And I was thinking, did she ever have a starring role in, in a TV show, and she never did. She always did guest spots. She, her career was always, you know, these one-off guest spots. So, but very famous. And of course, the late Luke Perry from TV's Beverly Hills 90210, he's appearing in his final screen role here. Now, again, there are so many familiar faces and vaguely, you know, vaguely familiar, you're gonna say, oh, who's that person? That, you know, again, you're gonna be hard pressed to recognize everyone before you have to turn your attention back to the story. It wasn't until afterwards where the you know the the credits came up and and then I was like, oh yeah, that was that. Oh yeah, that. And but then even afterwards, I was talking with my colleagues and saying, well, which role did Michael Madsen have? And you know, okay, there was Bruce Dern, and you know, you know, a few of them are very recognizable. And of course, Kurt Russell. You know, a lot of his a lot of Tarantino's regulars are in this film as well. But there's other ones where you say, well, which role did he have? Because there's so many people and the story just is so powerful that you're going to, you need to focus on the story, not so much the people. There's also a huge, not a huge number, a large number of Hollywood's next generation of stars, including Andy McDowell's daughter, Margaret Qualley. I've never seen her before, but she looks just like her mother. I mean, I, I looked at her without even knowing who she was. I looked at her and I said, ah, I know her, who her mother is. Ethan Hawke and Uma Thurman's daughter, Maya Hawke. Okay, I knew who she was, yeah. Kevin Smith's daughter, Harley Quinn Smith. And Bruce Willis and Demi Moore's daughter, Rumor Willis. So again, like he's, he's, he's saying, even in his casting, he's saying, you know, that... Um, and of course, you know, these are all his friends' kids. You know, this is probably why they're in there. But, you know, he's giving a message about the youth, how Hollywood has changed, it was in the point of changing to be very youth-oriented. Now, Tarantino is calling this film his Roma, his, which really refers to last year's memory piece by director Alfonso Cuaron, the wonderful, fabulous, I don't want to say wonderful, fabulous film, um, about, based on his childhood growing up in Mexico City. Um, you know, Tarantino grew up in Los Angeles, so he says this is this was his life. But of course, this is fiction. This is, with the exception of two leading the two leading characters, almost every other character is based on a real person. But the story is fiction. It's it's sort of like a hyper hyper realized fiction. Now, unlike so many of his other films, though, uh, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, it follows a strict linear structure. I was really surprised, like you know, because films he always has flashbacks. And I kept expecting flashbacks to happen, but there weren't any. Um, he also has chapters. This really has two chapters, but they're very subtle. Um, you know, there's one, the, it, the, it starts in February 1969. It takes place over a day or two. And then it goes six months later to August 1969 and a day or two. And that's, that's really it for the chapters. But the interesting thing is, we, you know, we know that Charles Manson... 
uh, his followers killed Sharon Tate on August the 9th. So every scene that Sharon Tate is in, or the or Margot Robbie as Sharon Tate is in, you know, we have this sort of f dread that something's going to happen to her. You know, we know that something's going to happen. So that, you know, this plays out through the whole film. But what Tarantino's camera does is he follows Sharon Tate around Hollywood as she goes uh, to a party at the Playboy Mansion. She picks up a gift for her husband. She watches herself on the big screen in The Wrecking Crew with Dean Martin. And he doesn't give Margot Robbie very many lines. You know, people, I've read some early reviews after, after the film premiered at Cannes where people were saying, well, she doesn't talk very much. And I get it. I think what he's trying to say is we all think we know Sharon Tate, but we really don't. And Really, what do we really know about her? Well, what we know about her is that she was killed by Sharon, but that she was killed by Charles Manton, Manson's people. But we really don't know her. And I thought that was really well done, that we see her, but we don't know her. So now, in, in true Tarantino style, though, you know, in, in some ways it's very different from his other films. In other ways, it's similar. It's, as I said, it's a highly stylized work of speculative fiction. It has wonderful dialogue. It has some great laugh-out-loud lines. It has one scene of over-the-top violence, and it has some really memorable performances. Uh, Pitt and DiCaprio are very, very good, and apparently they've said they would love to work together. They had such a good time, they would love to work together, work together again. They were very, very good together. Now, all in all, I'd say this is not his best film, but it is pretty darn good, and it's very entertaining. And I'd say, mo more importantly, it merits worth watching more than once. You have to, I think, I've only seen it once. I saw it the other night. I would definitely go see it again. And I rarely, rarely say this, that I would like to see a film a second time right away. You know, it's like, yeah, if I see a second film in five years from now, no big deal. But it, this is a film I'd like to see a second time right away because there's so much to this story in terms of the acting, in terms of who's who. Um, because you do see a lot of, of, of actors playing real people and, you, and you're trying to piece that all together as you're, starting, as you're watching the film. So there's a lot of work that you got to do if you want to do it. Like for somebody like me, you want to do that work. Um, but if not, just watch and enjoy the film. So I really enjoyed this film. Highly recommend it. I see it's 9 o'clock. i got to shut up. Have a great weekend. Um, if you're in Europe, I hope the weather is, uh, the hot weather is broken. Here it's still 36 degrees, but that's normal for Hong Kong. Have a great weekend. Have a great week. See ya.